you have Jesus coming into the world, going through and out, and he's taking people along with him. And will you follow along with Jesus on the way to the cross? Well, hello and welcome to Movie Thought, the show where we look at Jesus and storytelling and filmmaking and those kinds of things. And today I'm joined by Dan Chapman. Hello, how are you doing? Hello, I'm very well. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming on and uh, chatting about Jesus. Who? <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. No, yeah, no, you're very welcome. So Dan, I was wondering if we could start with, like, how, yeah, how do we know each other? Why are you here, basically? Uh, well, you, you ran me up and you asked me if you'd like to do this. We know each other from university. We've gone to the same college and we got to know each other through the College Christian Union. Oh, yeah. For anyone not um, acquainted with the idiosyncrasies of the Cambridge system is that because we all live in our own little bubbles of our own colleges, um, each college has its own quite small Christian union, but there is like an umbrella, it's called KICU, um, that is the intercollegiate Christian union. Uh, and so they do like stuff on a whole university scale. And uh, I was um, the coordinator of the events week of the year of the plague. Um, so the, the 2020 of, or 2021, I guess, because it was in February. Um, and so yeah i i coordinated a lovely team there was eight of us in total and we planned for about a year uh and we got you know ran a website and we ran two weeks of events um that ended up big online um we had some time planned marquee planned other things but um we had this whole thing just trying to like yeah trying to meet people where they're at and present them with who jesus really is give that that opportunity for people to have conversations to experience ideas that they may not have done otherwise so that's been me over the last year or so that's really cool yeah certainly a, a pretty bizarre weird year to do a kind of christian union outreach events week isn't it um but it's mm. cool you've been able to do bits and bobs and included within that you did a kind of podcast reading uh, the gospel of luke didn't you a, a kind of dramatized reading of the text all word for word, the entire Gospel of Luke. Yeah, it's the, um, it's the kind of thing that I could not find someone who had done it before. It's quite common, like David Suchet and his lovely deep voice, like <laughs> reading through. Usually you just have a dude reading the whole thing. Uh, but yeah, this was, you know, we had the narrator had a, a voice and each individual character, like Jesus obviously was the biggest part. And um, there, but there were a bunch of like, who's the disciple, who is the woman in the crowd, who is whatever. Uh, and so we did it in seven parts since, you know, over the two weeks we had an event every other day. And so there would be the main event. But um, if we were doing it all in person, there would be some opportunity, you know, if you wanted to carry on engaging or maybe you'd heard people talk about Jesus or the Bible, but you actually wanted to engage with it for yourself. The normal way that we do that is you just leave like a gospel on the table. Like I have one here that, you know, they're usually just really small. This is the gospel of Luke. Um, and it'd be very easy to just take this free little book away with you and just read it. It wouldn't take very long. And since we're not in person, like how did we, how do we kind of emulate that? So that's kind of where the project came out of. And so after each of the seven events, there was one out of seven parts. And so each was about 20 minutes long. So about two and a half hours, for the entire story of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Um, and like after that, we had a podcast after it as well, because, again, we had this whole philosophy of like, how do we engage with people? How do we meet with people where they're at when we're basically just broadcasting from far away? And so what we did is we got a bunch of um, the actors and people involved in the project to listen to it with their friends. Um, so I did that with a couple of my mates. Uh, we reacted to episode three. And so they listened to about 20 minutes of it. They weren't Christians at all. And then the podcast afterwards was all just like us reacting to it. And being like, Jesus was spicy, wasn't he? And like, yeah, just that, the conversations that flowed out of that. And so it was certainly a new way that, people engage with the Bible, both Christians and non-Christians. 
And so it was like, it was a cool thing to be involved with. Yeah. Your approach was, you know, let, let's just, we're going to present the entire gospel of Luke here in a podcast. And it's going to be weird to some people and it's going to be unusual, but here it is. And um, let's just dive straight into it. And it's really cool that you, you did that. And it sounds like it had a an exciting It helps people reaction. because if you ever have a conversation with someone, like it's often really unhelpful when you both think that you know you're talking about the same thing you're talking yeah. about really different stuff. Like when I chat to my friends, very often the God that they reject and the God that they have issues with and really hate isn't the God I worship. So even though we might use this common language of we talk about God or we talk about the Bible or Christianity, like the things that's going on in my brain when you say those words is so different to what would be going on in my friend's head. So it's just so, I think, helpful often to frame the conversation around like here's a common thing that we can actually like yeah come together on and we're talking about the same thing it doesn't mean we all agree but it does mean that at the very least we're not talking cross purposes yeah oh absolutely and why did you choose the gospel of luke because obviously we've got matthew mark and john as well um i guess you had to pick one but um yeah what what made you go for luke um there's a few reasons so on a really practical note, the, the little gospel that I waved around just now, this had been given to um, every student in the university, or at least every student had the opportunity to have one if they wanted one. And so since we were doing um, the you know fortnight of event events afterwards, we wanted to kind of be consistent with what we were doing as a whole CU. And so we followed on Luke. But there's, there's a few particular reasons why Luke beyond other gospels. Um, Probably a reason against it, I suppose, is because it's the longest gospel. You know, usually like you go for something quite short, you'll convince people to read like a short number of pages. Um, but Luke's, I think, double the size of Mark, which is the shortest gospel. Uh, but there are quite a few other things going for it in that it often has the less, least amount of pre-required knowledge to get to it. And what I mean by that is like, so it's something like uh, Matthew is is very Jewish, like it's supposed to be read by everyone, but all the early Christians were themselves Jews. And if you pick up any gospel, you'll see references to prophecy. And so you know that you're entering this story like partway through, like stepping into a river that's already flowing. And so because like the story of Jesus is part of a larger story, it can often be quite easy to get lost in what's all this stuff about sacrifices and temples and priests and Pharisees that you don't you can't really grasp hold of and Luke is kind of special in that he is a Gentile which is you know he's not a Jew so he's coming at from this from the outside he's become a Christian whilst never having been a Jew before and he's kind of gathered this this collection of eyewitness accounts that he's investigated and he's putting it forward as like okay I have written an orderly account he says at the beginning uh, to his friend the most excellent Theophilus and so you would know the certainty of what you've been taught so he's brought together all this stuff so it's a very like holistic picture I feel like if you want to like start with what Christianity is about with the minimum amount of pre-reading um, I think Luke is a really good place so that's that's why we chose it for the project. Mm, that's really interesting yeah so so we've got this story I think it might be worth just before we dive into it just kind of touching on like the bible is is the word of God um but it's uh, unlike the the Quran for instance we're not claiming that it's the verbatim um word of God it hasn't literally it's not like God literally uh speaks for a person as a mouthpiece and the verbatim the, the gospel is the verbatim word of God it is it's inspired and so um, Luke was mm, writing mm. an account and, and it's the word of God and it's turned out exactly as God wanted it to be and yet he, Luke himself had an agency in how he kind of compiled um, and, and you know told these events so I was wondering if you could just kind of touch on mm. that yeah like who is the storyteller here um, yeah if you there's always a thing like if you're gonna make it up who benefits and it's like if you're going to pretend to be Jesus or you're going to pretend to be someone really famous like Peter, then there's something to be gained, I guess, from impersonating a big name. Where it's just like nobody knows who Luke is. He's just a complete rando um, from you know clues within the book itself. And you also encounter him in um, the book of Acts and in some of the letters. 
you find that Luke is a doctor who is a traveling partner of one of the first Christian missionaries, a guy called Paul. And so he's kind of swept up in this whole early Christian movement. And he's by no means the first person to write, you know, something in the New Testament. So the majority of all the letters you find in your Bible today, they were written before Luke came to his gospel. And I think Mark had written his gospel, I think, earlier as well. So he comes to it afterwards, having seen all this stuff. And yeah, when you talk about the words of God, because partly it's, you know, recording the words of Jesus, it is the words of God. But it's also, if, if Luke was going to make it up, there's like a few, I think, misconceptions that people carry around. One is maybe like legendary development. You know, Luke is maybe the second gospel written. And so maybe it's had some time to grow and develop and change. But, you know, to kind of go back to, he's a traveling partner of Paul. Like all of this has been, yeah, just a couple of decades after it's happened. And so the Christian letters that we have um, are recorded, you know, very, very soon after the Christian movement begins as a whole. And Luke comes out maybe AD 70-ish. That's like an approximate date. I'm not, I'm not going to get into the scholarly argument about exactly when to date things. Um, one thing I found really helpful when I was, you know, first becoming a Christian, engaging with it as well, was like kind of like a historical test. Because it's one thing to say it's the word of God just because it's in the Bible. But it's like as a historical document, can we trust it? And what's really nice about it is it's just chock full of detail about, um, say, there's an instance where Jesus calls to a guy in a tree. Like there's this cat tax collector who's really short and he really wants to see Jesus. So he climbs a sycamore fig tree to go and see him. And then Jesus sees him and calls him down, and says, let's have dinner. But it's just like, do sycamore fig trees grow in the region? And it's like, that's the kind of thing you can go away and check. You can check if, you know, people in that part of the world in that time really are called those names like um, Zacchaeus or Simon or things like that or Sibian. So I really love how much, how rich in historical detail it is that you can actually go away and kind of do Luke's, like check his maths in a way, like check that he's, he's using reliable sources where he's getting his information from. Um, so I think Luke did a good job in compiling it all. But yeah, the point I was making is like, this is a trustworthy biography of the life of Jesus, Yeah. Um, which, which is kind of like, th this is kind of why it's so precious. Because if you can get an insight into, you know, God with skin on is who we really believe Jesus is, like the character of God imprinted into the human flesh. And so if we can get like an accurate picture of that guy, it is like gold to us. Um, Luke actually wrote more than just the gospel of Luke. So he also wrote uh, the book of Acts as well. So he tells this unified story, starting with Jesus and then going on into the early church of basically how the spirit was making this new kind of human being. So he follows this whole um, journey and it doesn't just end with Jesus ascending back into heaven. Uh, he has this whole thing about how God is, is moving throughout the entire world and how the gospel is spreading. And so, yeah, it is just like really, really great. Like I, I can't really fault Luke. Yeah, that's awesome. Maybe we're talking on different different wavelengths. No, no, that's really helpful because I, I think an objection people raise is they say, oh, well, you trust the Bible, but the Bible tells you to trust the Bible. So it, it feels like a closed loop. Um, but I think this is really helpful in kind of how do we break into that loop? Everyone comes to a text with certain biases. If you're an atheist, you will come to the Gospel mm. of Luke and say, well, I'm reading about God here. God doesn't exist. And therefore, this is false. But So I think we've all got to kind of come to it with a degree of humility and say, OK, this is a historical document. Mm. You're talking about the Bible saying the Bible's trustworthy. It's just like bible like do you know like french i remember like, studying french in school being a little kid and being like the, the bibliotheque and the bibliotheque is the library and so uh, it, the bible is from the same root word it's this whole collection and so it's probably worth mentioning that the the letters written by christians to other christians the biographies of jesus um the poetry that, that history like when we come to individual books of the bible we should be reading them with different hats on like it would be silly to come to the book of Psalms with like a historian's hat on 
because it's a book of songs and poetry. And so say so something like we should trust the Bible saying we should trust the Bible is like maybe it's an example of an early Christian saying we should trust like these Old Testament prophecies which are fulfilled in Jesus. So it's just like there's a level of be aware of what you're reading because I don't think it's it's humble or it's, it's unreasonable to assume I can come to something written in a different culture in a different time completely and I, I have the arrogance to assume that I will understand it fully and perfectly on my first read that I won't miss anything so yeah just just for the rest of the conversation Luke is like a historical biography which is kind of why it's so easy to interact with that's really helpful yeah so you you wouldn't read other parts of the bible the same way you read Luke um that's that's really helpful yeah so so we have the storyteller we have God inspiring this uh, gospel through uh, recorded through Luke um, so we need some characters don't we um, so um, let's start with Jesus um, we've probably all ho heard of Jesus but uh, this is going to be a bit of a bit of a curveball Dan but um, who is Jesus uh -huh. <laughs> um, I quite like my description from earlier Jesus is God with skin on yeah like the yeah. if you want to get to know god you get to know jesus it's that kind of thing where you can get to know god in various kind of partial like muddied ways where you can't quite see the whole thing but if you really want to see god's heart if you want to see what matters to him if you want to see what god's about then if you look at jesus then you see it um so yeah jesus is god in the flesh rocked up um to show us what life's about i feel nice yeah that's really cool um but but then he also claims to be mm. the son of god so he is god and he's the son of god how, like how does that work yeah but this is this is a whole thing about trinity because i guess a, a criticism that uh, islam often makes of christianity is just like they particularly go at the trinity um and it's it's just it's very empirical is how i describe it because you come along and you have like Jesus and the spirit and the father and all of them are God and all of them only do things that God does and have power that only God has and receive worship that only God can receive. And you're just left with like, well, we have like these distinctive things that are all definitely God. And so that's where we come up with an idea of the Trinity. So Jesus, like, this is, I guess, quite important because Jesus has a few names he goes by. Uh, one is the son of God, one is the son of man, quite commonly. Um, son of God is quite clearly like son of God. There, there's like, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it other than maybe something about local culture, about like the son has the full status of the father. So it's kind of like being a prince in a kingdom. And it like what you say, the authority of your words is in, the king who is behind you there's also another picture of jesus kind of sitting down at the right hand of the father it's just like being god's right hand man and therefore wielding all of god's power all of god's authority and so that's kind of like easy to understand i guess being the son of god this guy is clearly divine he has clearly got more about him than the rest of the stuff um son of man is actually the title jesus calls himself more often and that's referring actually to a prophecy. If you read in the book of Daniel, uh, in chapter seven, there's this really bizarre vision that Daniel has. And there's someone called the Ancient of Days sat on the throne. He is God over there. And there's someone who comes on the clouds of heaven and then sits at the right hand of the Ancient of Days and is given glory, authority and sovereign power. Uh, it's quite easy to remember because that spells gasp glory, authority, sovereign power. And it's like one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. And so the son of man is someone like quite attached to this particular vision that you have maybe the more ethereal version that people imagine of God, you know, in his throne ruling the universe. But there's someone else who is God and receives the worship only God can receive and receives all the power that God has. But he's, he's kind of like a dude. And it's like, what's going on? And so Jesus calls himself the son of man, just being like, I, I am the dude. But it's sufficiently confusing that people don't instantly kill him for blasphemy when he says it. Um, so it's like, a, it's a nice, like, sneaky thing that Jesus says. Um, 
Fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I was wondering if we could press into the qualities of Jesus. Like, what is he like as a, as a person? What was really interesting was in the response in the podcast, like, people would listen to about 20 minutes of the Gospel of Luke. And listening to the conversations, like, people were having and I was having with non-Christian friends, it was always like there would be something spicy that Jesus said, something difficult or something where you really couldn't remain neutral for him. But it was interesting seeing like the, like hearing those seven conversations, no one had any criticism of Jesus' character. It was always very clear that he outclassed us, the way he like um, gives new life and heals the sick and the poor and brings in the outcast and just brings life where there is death in our society and gives this newness and so no one could ever fault his moral caliber was really interesting listening to it but he would never just leave it at arm's length Jesus would never or I guess Luke in presenting Jesus would never present Jesus as just this nice bloke there would always be some edge where you just You either would have to lean in and say, yes, I am about this. Whatever Jesus was saying, what he was doing, like there would be something that you just couldn't remain neutral about. And it was interesting seeing just people react away, like even though they might have got the logic and yeah, maybe loving my neighbor does sound like a thing that's really sensible and self-evident. It's still just that stick of Jesus wants us to follow him. He wants us to be sold out and pursue him. It's not like let's remain neutral about this good moral teacher, like a kind of far off Buddha figure. Like Jesus is very in and present and he is he's inviting us on that journey. Um, I should I say. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I've just realized that the meeting has six minutes left. Um, Yeah, so Dan, um, does Jesus have a a sense of humour? Because I think a kind of a stereotype of Christianity, strangely, is that it's quite severe and that, you know, we see paintings of Jesus and we think, hmm, he's quite a stern figure. Um, Like, would he have been a a fun guy (laughs) to be around with? Like, (laughs) I think so. Like, are you acquainted with The Chosen? That's been being released recently. No, I really want to see that. Oh my goodness. Well, it's on <laughs> YouTube. You have no excuse. And okay. um, genuinely, my favorite episode of like but season two is coming out now. Favorite episode of season one is um, episode five, The Wedding at Cana. And it's just Jesus at a party. And it's just so good. And just like Jesus does have, um, I, I do think Jesus had a sense of humor. Partly, like, I can logic that through I am made in the image of God. And we are as as humans and humor is a very big part of just kind of like how we are, how culture, how we interact. And so therefore, I don't think humor arrived at the fall. I feel like I don't think humor is connected to sin, you know. So I do think it's just something that God blesses us with. And therefore, it's a characteristic of God. Um, I do have this thing about. No one wants to be the Bible translator with swear words. And I think like (laughs) humor has the same thing. Like there's, there's, for example, there's plenty of examples where people are really quite rude to each other in say particularly Kings as there is an example. And they definitely didn't use quaint sterile language for it. There's a moment where the general of Assyria is calling to the the watchers on the walls in Jerusalem and threatening like you're going to, eat your own dung and drink your own urine and it's just like I don't think he wouldn't have used sterile language that's one silly example you know when Paul says um you know I I consider um all all these things rubbish compared to the passing surpassing riches of of Christ it's like he uses a rude word for poo there rather than just rubbish so it's just like no one wants to do that and so in that same vein of like what do you do if you're a scholar like jokes are really hard to translate. Like I'm a massive fan of stand-up comedy. And there's like, if you read a transcript of like a stand-up show, the transcript really may not be very funny compared to like actually being there. 
so there's definitely times where I read Jesus and I can imagine it being funny or I can imagine it being uneasy depending on how you read it um but for example like two two things like you know it's easier for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than a camel to enter the eye of a needle like that could you could imagine that line being de delivered really severely or you know just like ah, oh, it's a ridiculous thing um and so I feel like it's quite hard to communicate through the medium of um, the written word 2000 years later in a different language, uh, any sense of humor. But I do love um, GK Chesterton ended her, this book, Orthodoxy, and it's a really intense, like so many ideas flopping around with like really cool theological concepts and stuff like that. He just ends the whole thing just being like, you know what, when Jesus went up onto the mountain to pray by himself, and he just had like these hidden times with God, like what special thing was going on? Like what, what was so amazing about the character of God that just the world was not ready for it yet. And just, it just got hidden in these private times. And he just ends the, this, this long theological book. And it's just like, you know what? I reckon it was his sense of humor. Like he'd go away, <laughs> he'd refresh his soul with God. He'd have a little giggle because the disciples bless them didn't know left from right most of the time they were really clueless if you read the gospel narratives really didn't get what was going on and so if they don't get what's going on on a basic level if jesus starts making jokes as well they're like they're gonna lose it <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting yeah and actually a lot of the imagery as you said that jesus uses in his parables is is quite humorous isn't it um and sometimes it's making various serious points um and it's kind of calling out the whitewash uh, in the, in the in the hypocritical pharisees and things like that um but yeah, yeah. It, yeah it's kind of very cutting use of sarcasm i, I always think of the um yeah do not try to remove the speck from your friend's eye if you have a plank of wood in your own eye and yeah, it's, exactly. it's such a great image because we immediately we've never heard of that before and yet we all kind of know what it means and it's just this image of like someone with a plank of wood sticking out there right like it's it's oh, you got a plank. <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's a ruler but um yeah it's incredibly you got a plank down that's like brilliant <laughs> Who knows? It's almost like I planned I, But this. it's like a big thing in the Gospel of Luke. The big thing in the Gospel of Luke is that Jesus goes to a load of parties. Like he throws yeah. dinner parties. He gets like he goes to parties with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes. He gets invited to fancy dinners with the elites and the religious leaders. Like Jesus goes to quite a lot of parties and lots of people throw him parties. And, you know, a, a lot of the conversations from them are recorded there. Um, but you know that. Jesus knew how to handle himself in those. I don't think he was a boring dinner guest, shall we say. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and the fact that, yeah, he goes to the, the wedding and he turns water into wine. Um, and so much of what Jesus does is around food and, and communion around, around the dinner table. And the kind of paradigm, I guess, is the feast, isn't it? That at the end of time, um, the followers of Christ will be feasting with Jesus. And like that, that's a, a fun image, isn't it? It's, uh, it's, it, you know, he is a, a God who just kind of the, the grace flows out and there's joy and there's feasting. Um, so I, yeah, as you say, I think he must've been a pretty fun guy to be around and will be. <laughs> but that's a, that's a larger point about like, I guess, good and evil. And it's just sure. like, I don't know if you've read any, imagine reading a book where everyone just like lived in peace and harmony and they just had a really nice time. Like it just wouldn't be very exciting. We love stories and fiction of just like this person murdered them and they're sleeping with them and here's this plot of intrigue going on. And like fictional evil is always much, much more exciting than fictional good. But in reality, it's always switched around. The idea is like, yeah, that life with God is just, goodness and like you can have like a feast and it's just not it doesn't sound that exciting if you're gonna like write like a book of history for instance like the historians aren't interested in and for 40 years it was peaceful they were interested in like for three years loads happened and it was miserable to live in so there's there's like this thing where I feel like our imaginations can really just be captured by something that feels really exotic and it's gonna satisfy us and jesus is really good at like poking that and untangling it like there's an example of one parable he tells of just like this farmer who 
get a bumper crop one year. So he says, you know what I'm going to do? This is brilliant. I'm going to demolish my barns. I'm going to build bigger barns and I'm just going to take it easy, like early retirement. This is literally like a gold mine has arrived in my fields. I can just store it up, take life easy. And then God comes around the corner and is like, you fool, you're going to die tomorrow and this is all going to be a waste. And it's just like, Jesus has this way of subverting those things that we think will make us happy, that we think will satisfy us. And just again, leaves us with that uncomfortable decision. Will we follow him? Will we go towards his vision of what life should look like? Or do we kind of reject and push away? All right, yeah. So I think this is possibly my favourite um, Jesus comeback in the Gospels. Um, it's in Luke chapter 20. I think it's also told in Matthew. It might be in the others as well. Um, so I'll read it out. Start of Luke 20. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? He replied, I will, uh, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or, for, of, or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, of all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that, bo that John was a prophet. So they answered, we don't know where it was from. Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. <laughs> and it's just like, they go off and have their little board meeting. And they're like, we can't, we, <laughs> we, we can't agree on the two answers. If we give either answer, it won't work. So we're just going to say we don't know. And Jesus is like, right, well, I'm not telling you either. Then. <laughs> it is great, isn't it? It's, it's like a really good precedent for as we as Christians talk to people, we don't have to be stupid. Um, say, for example, uh, I go around and I, I ask you the question. It's like, does your mother know that you're stupid? And you can say yes, in which case you are stupid and your mother knows it. You can say no, in which case you're stupid and your mother doesn't know it. Or you can say, I don't know, in which case you are so stupid, you do not understand the question. And so it's like there's, there's very easy to engineer little traps for people. Yeah. And certainly, like, that's what they're trying to do to Jesus, because either Jesus discredits himself and says he's not from God, or they're trying to trap him into saying, like, I am from God. And so they can try and nail him with some charges or something like that. Um, and it's very key, maybe like what we we're talking about parables before, where Jesus can be a little bit opaque sometimes. I remember when I was... Um, on the reaction podcast chatting with my friends and one of the criticisms that a friend of mine had was that it seems like jesus like i don't know it could be a better evangelist he could you know make it a bit more accessible like put a bit more effort in bringing people along with him um but it was quite clear when jesus faced opposition or when there were people who really wanted to follow him he would always had time and was always accessible for someone who came to him humbly and was willing to learn and follow. Whereas people who came to him very proud and prideful, he would be very opaque and it just wouldn't be inaccessible, kind of like the equivalent of someone who hears the parable and just walks off without really understanding it. And the same way here, like if they were sincere and they were sincerely coming to Jesus, he could have a sincere conversation back with them. But he almost like lets down this little test and just like, if you're not going to be real with me, I can't be real with you. And also, yeah, he discredits them because so clearly they are not being the rational champions that they are claiming to be. They are just playing political game and trying to uh, trap Jesus in his words. So, no, I, I do. I do like exactly this parable, too. Or not parable. This episode. So with that, I was wondering, yeah, could we kind of press into like the structure of Luke's gospel, the kind of the arc um, or the, the, the kind of themes running throughout. Yeah, this is a really helpful thing of when you just sit down and read a gospel all the way through or, yeah, you do something where you like listen to the podcast or like I did working on this project. You just spend a lot of time in Luke. And um, if you're a Christian, like the main way I guess you might have interacted with the gospels over your lives is in talks and in sermons and you may be very well familiar with the things that go on 
but it's kind of difficult in a sermon to go through much more than one episode. And it's unusual, um, at least in preaching, to have something longer than, I don't know, maybe a dozen verses or something like that. And so you get a really different perspective when you have the whole arc of the book ahead of you. And you kind of see the things that Luke does earlier on and how, how those themes develop. Um, and the kind of seven thunder fundamental plot lines, if you're gonna like characterize stories as one or another, Luke I think is quite easy to characterize because his story is, is the journey very much. So there's this whole intro introductory series of stories which kind of does the birth and early narrative of Jesus and John the Baptist and it's all coming in and Jesus is coming into the world and John the Baptist is this great prophet who's going to prepare the way for the Lord and Jesus is the Lord the promised king of Israel and Jesus is coming into the world and then you see in this early section of Luke he's he's forming this new community of people he, you see the first few examples of his miracles of him performing he um he makes his declaration statement at the beginning that uh, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has uh, anointed me to preach good news to the poor, freedom for prisoners, new sight for the blind. And so you see Jesus starting doing this thing with, with some opposition when he announces that people try and throw him off a cliff and so on like that. So it's like it's still not easy to remain neutral to Jesus. But all of this like forming up builds into this moment in chapter nine where Jesus takes a few of his followers up a high mountain and yeah who does he think he is he's just this carpenter's son he's just like this dude like why does he have the nerve to ruffle so many feathers and he goes up this mountain with his disciples uh, Peter James and John and he is transfigured before them and his he glows like lightning and the cloud of just God's presence wraps up in them and two really, really important figures from the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, rock up. And they start having a little planning meeting with Jesus. And they start talking about Jesus's exodus. And it's kind of like this contrast of like, who does this guy think he is? What's he doing? You kind of reveal after all this hype in this kind of secret moment at the top of a mountain. This is really who Jesus is. And the voice of God says, you know, this is my son. Listen to him. And then from that point, the majority of the book is the journey to Jerusalem. Like it's quite famous, like the whole passion narrative where Jesus uh, is crucified and rises again. Like that happens at the end of the book. And then we have, you know, the empty tomb and some encounters with the risen Jesus. But the bulk of this book that Luke has presented by far is Jesus coming into the world and coming into the world. And then you have this peak moment which is a turning point where this is really who Jesus is. And he chats to the two resident experts in all of space and time about how to do an exodus, you know, chatting to Moses and Elijah. And then he goes on this long journey where he teaches people, where he sends them out, where he calls people to follow him, where he calls the census disciples to go, like go ahead of me to towns to prepare for me. And so he goes one by one to all these places. So it's kind of, winding road and this section is where most of Jesus's parables are and then you hit Jerusalem and the next turning point is Jesus arriving in Jerusalem on a donkey and then that's very much like the wheels have been set in motion Jesus has kind of deliberately organized things so that everything comes to a head on that final week uh, and you're, you're just kind of locked into the narrative after that point um, but do you get what I mean? You have Jesus coming into the world, going through and out, and he's taking people along with him. And will you follow along with Jesus on the way to the cross? Wow. Yeah, that's really cool, isn't it? It's amazing. I've, I've read um, the Gospel of Matthew through um, almost uh, in a couple of sittings. And, and that was kind of the mm. first time in, in my life that I'd, I'd done that. Um, and it's really interesting because I'd I'd heard, as you said, sermons probably on most of the passages, but actually seeing, reading it in one go and seeing that actually a lot of them link together that we didn't think. So, for example, the coming of the storm is immediately followed by the, the casting out of um, the demon into the into the pigs. Um, mm. So it's like Jesus crosses the lake 
and then there's that incident and you realize that actually some of these things he goes from straight straight from one thing into another and it's just as you say it's really interesting to see that kind of bigger picture running through isn't it oh yeah exactly that example where i think it's really good that you have the feeding of the 5000 and then there's a whole like argument with some religious teachers and they're asking Jesus for a sign and Jesus is like, I'm not going to give you a sign. Yeah. And if you just read that a second bit in isolation, you're like, oh, what's Jesus doing? But it's just like, if you have the whole flow, you're like, Jesus just did a bunch of miracles. Were you watching? And they just like, no, give us a, give us a sign or we won't believe you. <laughs> and you go, like, there's these whole little things that you just can't see if you don't go through. Yeah. Yeah. So you, the only way you're really to bring out more of the the richness of the text is to yeah you have to you have to see it as a bigger picture don't you um mm, yeah. yeah so so jesus tells stories within the story he tells parables um so yeah i mean i mean we love storytelling on this channel um stories within stories it sounds like we're kind of getting into inception territory here doesn't it um but yeah, so why <laughs> why do you think Jesus does that? Why why does he speak in parables a lot of the time? I mean, there's there's two reasons. Uh, one is oddly to be more accessible, and one is to be less accessible. So a good example of that is um, when Jesus does the parable of the sower and the seeds. And so you imagine like you've heard that this this massive prophet's coming into town. And you kind of crowd around and you go and see him. Or maybe you're a Pharisee and you kind of would like to see this guy come to no good. And you're kind of looking to see if you can trip him up. And this whole crowd gathers around. And he starts just talking about a farmer goes out into the fields and the seeds fall on the path, get eaten by the birds. And some seeds fall into the thorns and they grow up, but then they're, they're just kind of choked and they don't produce good fruit. And you just come away from it. I mean, imagine just going home. And your mate's just like, ah, oh, you saw that Jesus guy then. What was he like? And he's just like, I just, he just said some things, didn't he? Like, you know, maybe I got some free food. Maybe my, my knee doesn't hurt anymore. But you kind of went and you're not very interested and you leave. And then um, his disciples, which aren't just the 12 disciples, by the way. Like, you know, to be fair, the Gospels are usually quite helpful. They talk about the 12. But if it says disciples in general, usually that's a much larger group. Um, including men and women and so anyone who actually was interested just chats to Jesus afterwards and like Jesus what on earth did you mean by that and then he explains it in much plainer language and so that means that Jesus can get away with saying much more subversive or controversial messages uh, in his ministry um, without people just being able to use it against him so that's one like basic reason and the other is kind of like you're talking about before like the idea of like a plank in someone's eye it's just way more accessible and memorable. Like you can imagine like stanzas of just like, maybe I need to re remember this moral poetry or something like that. But just something like the Good Samaritan just being such a part of like language in our culture at the moment is just because it's just a really memorable story that just sticks in the mind and it's quite easy to carry with you and then tell someone else. So it, parables are very good at illustrating points as well as maybe protecting the messenger, I guess. Wow, yeah. So they're quite polarizing, I guess, aren't they? Because for some people, as you say, they're just like, no, don't know what that was about. Don't want to hear any more. And then there are the people that are willing to go, okay, I don't quite understand what you meant by that, Jesus, but I want to. I realize I want to hang around this guy and I want to press into it. Um, and I guess, yeah, and God, God opens their eyes, and suddenly, the meaning of the parable is kind of is unlocked. I guess, isn't it? Um, so that's really interesting. Could you take us through a particular parable that you've been reflecting on? Our, I guess we, we talked about the parable mm. of the sower there, but were there any others that have really kind of been in your mind? Ah, oh, the thing is about Luke is there's lots of them. Mm. Like Luke has the majority of the parables. I don't really think John has any. Like So most of the parables that we would remember are found in Luke. Um, so one example that is generally actually unfamiliar within Christians as well. And um, I, I remember listening to the reaction podcast on this bit and they were like, didn't, didn't really get it at all. And it's the parable of the shrewd manager. Huh. It's, it's in Luke 16. And 
it just it seems at face value a little bit confusing in that Jesus seems to be praising a wicked person. And so the, the way the story goes is that there is a rich man and he has a manager who manages his things. And the rich man knows that the manager is corrupt and wicked and is going to fire him. And the manager hears about this and it's like, ah, I'm going to be out of a job soon. And he's just like, he, he kind of does process of elimination. I'm too ashamed to beg. I can't work with my hands. So what he decides is, you know, like he calls in everyone who owes his master money. He says, you know, you owe my master this much. Let's just make it down. Let's make it half. And so he calls these people in one by one. And he gives away all of his master's possession. Well, not all of them, but he just like t- fiddles the numbers, takes away the debts. And um, the master comes in. And the confusing bit about the parable is the master praises the wicked servant because he acted wisely or shrewdly. And Jesus then makes a point. I'll see if I can get it here. Yes, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And he makes a point about like following God or following money. I won't read the whole thing. But that's a slightly subversive story in that the the manager is wicked. He is evil. You shouldn't be like him. But that kind of wisdom, when the Bible talks about wisdom, say in the book of Proverbs, is when you get something about the universe, when you understand something about how God created things to be, so that you can almost go along in the grain of the universe. You know, like when you tear a piece of paper, and if you tear along the grain, it's really easy to get a straight line, but if you go the other way, it's a a jaggedy mess, or it takes a lot more effort to get a straight line. And the thing that this guy captured was that the point of wealth isn't, you know, so I can sit back and be rich. The point was he was using it so that he could get friends for himself. He was trading something that he couldn't keep to gain something that would last. And Jesus is like, that is a worthy thing. That is how my followers should use money. Because money is here today and gone tomorrow. You can't take it with you into the next life. And it's not secure enough that you could even stake your whole life on it. Like the only person who you could do that with is God. God is the only trustworthy one. So if you if you base your life, your security is coming from God, not money. What are you supposed to do with this money that you can't keep? And Jesus is saying, actually, the valuable thing is to trade something you cannot keep for something that you can. And so the point of this is actually a parable about generosity told in kind of subversive way. That it's just there's the point of your money is to go and make friends for yourselves, to bless people with it so that you can be welcomed into eternal dwellings. So it's just like, do you get what I mean about how those stories of Jesus, you could very easily read it once and just be like, meh, that, that sounded weird. And then just kind of dismiss Jesus. But Jesus is always there if you want to press in a bit more. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. He's, he's never far from us. Mm-hmm.